I've been a private investigator for the past 14 years, and today, I'd like to tell you about one of the most unsettling jobs I ever worked. It involves what appeared to be just a tragic case of a sudden and devastating heart attack, something that happens to far too many men around the world every single day. When the family of the man contacted me about the job, I almost didn't take it. You get a lot of folks that just aren't satisfied with being told that their loved one died due to an accident, or just a twist of fate or something, and their grief causes them to look for answers that just aren't there. I very delicately explained this to the man's family when they asked me to investigate the possibility that his much younger girlfriend had either killed him or arranged to have him killed. Unless she was a master poisoner who induced the heart attack with an untraceable compound, then I was reasonably certain that that was an innocent party. Yet, they insisted I investigate her, offering a sizable daily rate to do so, so I made an arrangement with them. I'd take the case for a week, and if I couldn't find anything remotely suspicious, then I'd move on. I'm not the kind of man to turn a grieving family into a cash cow simply because they can't accept an uncomfortable truth. So after they agreed to that, I got to work. Now I could understand how the dead man's relationship with this girl might arouse some suspicion. He was almost 60 years old, thrice married and divorced, and had an amount of wealth stashed away in various bank accounts after many successful years as a stockbroker. She, on the other hand, was a 22-year-old fitness model who made her money posting pictures of her butt on social media. They had been dating for about a year and had a fairly tumultuous relationship. Then one day, he just drops dead of a heart attack. The only thing was, she didn't appear to have benefited from his death at all. She wasn't named in the will, she was certainly making her own money, and she seemed genuinely grief-stricken by his sudden loss. The only real discrepancy was the fact that in the months before his death, Mr. Deadman, excuse me if I obscure the names here as a professional courtesy, had made a series of quite large payments in a Panamanian bank account in the months leading up to his death. But with the account being sheltered from the prying eyes of the IRS, there was no way of knowing who this person was, or if they might have presented a threat to Mr. Deadman's life. I asked Mr. Deadman's younger girlfriend if she had any idea who this person might be, and she said she had no idea. According to her, she didn't know of any debts her boyfriend had, and couldn't think of any reason as to why he was sending large amounts of money to a sheltered account. To this day, neither myself nor Deadman's family can say who this account belongs to exactly, but after doing a little more digging into his death, I think I can make an educated guess. I won't bore you with all the nitty gritty details of my investigation, which actually took a week longer than I'd promised due to a few details which emerged around days 5 and 6 of my work. I'll just tell you the one thing that made me think that Miss Fitness, what I'll call Dead Man's Girlfriend, was either the owner or very close to the owner of the Panamanian bank account. Eventually, I was able to get my hands on a copy of the 911 call which Miss Fitness made on the night of Dead Man's fatal heart attack. I was still exploring the possibility of it being some kind of hit, and since Miss Fitness told me that a lot of what happened that night was just a blur due to the overwhelming trauma she experienced, I figured that I'd take a listen to the 911 call to check if there was anything she mentioned to dispatch or EMTs that she either couldn't remember or had compartmentalized due to the trauma. That's when I discovered there was definitely something she wanted to keep quiet regarding the events of that evening, something that might implicate her in ways that, while aren't strictly illegal, could certainly open her up to some kind of civil suit which the family is now pursuing. Like I said, Dead Man and Miss Fitness had been dating for the better part of a year, and at least 80-90% to 90 of their rendezvous had been at the downtown apartment he was residing in following a very messy divorce. Miss Fitness must have visited the place a hundred times, and that's a conservative estimate, so imagine my surprise when she starts acting as if it was her first visit when the 911 dispatcher started asking her for Dead Man's address. She did eventually provide the pertinent details to the EMTs, but when they arrived, they were unable to revive him. But for the 24 minutes and 37 seconds of that call, Miss Fitness was unable to provide any details regarding the location of Dead Man's apartment. She seemed to know all too well what was happening to him, and described his symptoms to a T. 
chest pains, numbness in his left arm, profuse sweating, all very recognizable as a heart attack, but when it came to his address, even down to the apartment number, she seemed completely unwilling to pass along the information. I could understand if she was in a state of inconsolable panic, if she was wailing and weeping and begging Mr. Deadman not to leave her, but she wasn't. In fact, she sounded alarmingly level-headed. Then, when it came to the EMTs asking her to perform CPR on Dead Man, it didn't sound like she even attempted it. I've heard 911 calls where a person is asked to perform CPR and without fail, their voice goes quieter as they put down the phone and begin administering chest compressions. Fitness's voice was at the exact same pitch the whole time. She counted the compressions along with the EMT who was talking her through them, but unless she performed them with one hand and very little effort, I'm not sure she performed them at all. I was able to get a copy of the call via Freedom of Information request, and when I played it for Dead Man's adult children, we came to the same conclusion. Fitness hadn't murdered their father, but what she had done was take advantage of the fact that he had suffered a heart attack and simply let him die. This is what makes me think she's connected to the Panamanian bank account, and Dead Man's children agreed that not only was the motivation financial, but Fitness let their father die because he had threatened to take back whatever he had funneled to her. He may have well done this to conceal assets, and although the account might well be in her name, she was never intended a permanent recipient of the money. It's not uncommon for people to conceal their assets prior to divorce proceedings, but few people go to such extreme lengths to do so. From what we could tell, there had to be over a million dollars stashed away in that account, and again, that's a conservative estimate. And when it comes to dollar amounts I've known people to kill for, some have been far less than a million dollars. Since Miss Fitness had no legal obligation to save Dead Man's life, even if the family do manage to prove she acted maliciously, there's no legal recourse for them. However, I'm certainly no expert in civil or financial cases, and there might be grounds to sue for the suspected amount if they can prove the money funneling was done to conceal their father's assets. I'm not saying this case was the scariest or most frightening of my career, as I've certainly dealt with far more seedier and far more violent cases. But what gets me is the betrayal, and imagining the moment where Dead Man realized that one of the people he trusted the most in the world, someone he once trusted with upwards of a million dollars, was just going to let him die. There's no way in God's name she suddenly forgot the address and apartment number of the man she'd been dating for a year, or that she was panicking so bad that she couldn't even check the number on his door. If she was, I'd have heard it in her voice on that 911 call. No. Instead, she was struck by a sudden predatory urge to simply play dumb, all when a man's life was at stake. Men die of heart attacks every single day, all over the world, but I know for a fact that only around 10% of them are actually fatal. With a quick response and right treatment, most men survive them, and they serve as something of a warning to change lifestyle or cut out a certain substance. There's a good chance Dead Man knew that too, especially if a doctor had previously informed him that he was at risk of one. So I don't really want to imagine what it was like for him to go from, I'm going to be okay, to, this is my last night on earth, as his little piece of arm candy started to look less like a trophy wife and more like the Grim Reaper in yoga pants. I've never taken a bullet during my time as a private investigator, but I've been darn close on a number of occasions. This is the story of the time I was probably the closest to getting shot, and I still don't quite know how I managed to keep from getting hit. The job was to track down this junkie kid who dropped off the map on behalf of his parents, who were naturally deeply concerned for him. Sad thing was, they'd just gotten him through rehab and his reward for kicking his addiction was a brand new car. I think he lasted about three days before he sold the car at a dealership for cash before plunging back into his addiction. Thanks to several interviews with some of his closest friends and a few ex-addict associates, I managed to track him down to the East LA home of a person he'd met in rehab, and I knew he was in there because I saw him through the window. I knocked on the door, a guy answers it, and I ask if my missing kid is there. 
He asked if I'm a cop, and I say no, I'm a PI working for his parents who are extremely worried about him, and he'd do well to tell the kid to come to the door so we could talk before I called his parents. Now I know the kid is in the house, because as I said already, I saw him through a crack in the curtain, sitting at a computer chair with a blanket over his lap, looking about as spaced out as I'd ever seen a person get. I think the job is pretty much over, but to my surprise the guy who came to the door said no, he hadn't seen the kid. I just level with him, and as much as I'm polite enough to apologize for snooping, I let him know that I've seen the kid through a crack in the window. I remind the guy that the kid is in a huge danger of overdosing, as well as those who relapse with heroin are, and that he'd be doing a heck of a thing for his karma if he just did the right thing. The guy pauses, looks positively impressed for a second, then says, Sure, I'll go get him. He then shuts the door and again disappears from view. I figured he knew the game was up and there was no point hiding or anything, but just in case he was about to give the kid a heads up so he could escape through the backyard, I head over to the window just to make sure the kid isn't going anywhere. Not only does the kid not move and just carries on staring into space, but the guy doesn't even try to get him to come to the door. You gotta keep in mind, the room has that dimly lit addict ambience to it, so it wasn't like I had the best view of the kid. From all the pictures I'd seen of him of his best and worst, I knew enough to know it was him for sure. Only right at that moment, as I'm looking at him through the window a second time, I realize there's something not quite right about the way he's just kind of staring at the wall, and instead of feeling that sense of smug satisfaction that I've done my job, I started to get majorly worried. So worried in fact that as I walked back to the front door to knock on it again, I didn't even stop to think about where the kid's buddy had gone, or what he was doing. All that was on my mind was the idea that I hadn't found the kid alive and well as I'd intended to. I'd found a corpse instead. Then right as I'm thinking that, the door in front of me just explodes in a shower of splinters as I hear a burst of automatic gunfire coming from behind the door. I did exactly as I was trained as a cop. I hit the dirt, pulled out my sidearm, and returned fire through the door at least to try and suppress whoever had just tried to cut me in half. I was so certain that I was hit, I mean, how could I not after so many bullets had ripped through the wood in front of me? If I wasn't hit, it was nothing short of a complete miracle. But after crawling out of the driveway and taking cover behind my car, there wasn't a drop of blood leaking onto the ground. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I actually couldn't believe it. As I was on the line with the 911 dispatcher, I kept expecting to pull my hand back from somewhere under my clothes to find blood all over it, but it just didn't happen. Lucky for me, and because I was able to report a burst of automatic fire, three or four cop cars all arrived on the scene like lightning, and all within just a few minutes of each other. Even luckier, the shooter had run out the back of the house and escaped while they could, opting not to come out of the house and open up on me again. A second burst of whatever he was firing at me and I don't know if I'd been so lucky. I wasn't entirely lucky though, nor was my timing particularly perfect because when I thought something was off about the kid's face when I looked at him through the glass, it was because he was dead. The kid had indeed OD just like his parents feared that he would. It looked like he was scouring the entire city for the best H he could find and for his sins, he found it. Only instead of just fleeing the scene when his junkie buddies realized they had a corpse on their hands, they went about trying to dispose of it. The kid didn't have a blanket over his lower half because he wanted to stay cozy. He had a blanket on his legs because the person who had just cut them off didn't want to have to look at the stumps. His parents were devastated the whole thing was just so tragic, but as selfish as it sounds, I just still couldn't believe that I hadn't been shot. In the days that followed, when I wasn't just walking around in a dumb stupor still struggling to compute how lucky I'd been, I was experiencing a kind of elation that usually only comes in powdered form. I don't mean that to sound insensitive and I understand how horrible it was for the family. I guess I'm just struggling to put into words how a person feels after they go through such an intense near-death experience. And after that I tried to be more selective over which jobs I took. I feel like every person had a little jar of luck that runs dry over time and I used up an awful lot of that luck with such an incredible near miss. I still think about that kid sometimes though, 
and I feel horrible for his family. I wasn't the one that had to tell them that they lost their son and soon after they thought that they got him home and healthy again, but I can only imagine how painful it was for them to have to hear the bad news. After I retired from the Metropolitan Police back in 1997, I decided to take up some private detective work to pad out my retirement fund. In the run-up to getting the proverbial gold watch and handshake, I honestly thought I was ready to kick my feet up and start relaxing with the wife. But then the closer I came to the day itself, the more I realized that retirement seemed less like the long rest I'd earned and more like a slow decline of boredom and purposelessness. I knew a bloke that I used to work with that had started his own firm and he always said that I was welcome to take a few jobs with him whenever I decided to step away from the police, so that's exactly what I did. I had a long holiday in my belia with the wife, then gave him a call on the day I got home. On my first visit to his offices, he warned me that PI work would be considerably more tedious than the stuff I'd be doing for the Met. The difference was, I could make in a week what had previously been a month's wages. It all depended on who the client was and what the job entailed. I'll be honest, the prospect of boredom did bother me as that's exactly what I was hoping to avoid. But the idea of tripling my earnings for considerably less work than I was putting in for the Met, that was a very appealing proposition indeed. Little did I know, the very first job that I would be given would involve me biting off a lot more than I could chew, and although it seemed like some pretty standard PI work on the surface, it turned out to be far darker than I could have possibly imagined. At least 50% of all the jobs my old colleague took involved suspicions of infidelity, and that's exactly what my first job entailed. A woman had called into the firm and told them that her husband hadn't been home one time in weeks, and after being a bit of a homebody for most of their marriage, now spent almost all of his weekends claiming he was at work. She called his boss when she'd first started getting suspicious, only to be told that he'd never work a weekend in all his time there. She didn't have the wherewithal to actually follow him about all weekend, as he took their only car wherever he left the house. So instead of playing at being a detective herself, she decided to bring in the professionals. The first thing I worked out after tracking the bloke following the end of his shift is that he always visited this one particular two-story house in a particularly rough area of Croydon. At first, I took an educated guess that this was his mistress's home so I staked the place out for an evening to check out who was coming and going. I honestly expected to see just a younger woman living there, maybe even with him paying the rent on the place so he had a place to conduct his affair in private. But as the evening progressed, I noticed that lots of different men were coming and going from the place. Now if you're thinking, sounds like a brothel, then you'd be right. It's exactly what it was. But I didn't know it was a brothel, not in terms of having concrete proof. And that's exactly what the bloke's wife needed so she could properly rinse him during the divorce proceedings. This meant I needed a kind of taped confession, an actual admission of what he was doing or photographic evidence of him entering or leaving the property. The latter meant I needed proof of what the place was too, but that would be much easier to come by than pictures of the bloke doing the deed. So, that's the angle I started with, trying to get a connection so I could secure an invite to the brothel. It was relatively easy to be honest, I just followed one bloke to the pub after and got chatting to him in the smoking area outside. I told him I was new to the area and that I was recently divorced, and although I won't make your skin crawl with the seedier aspect of our conversation, he eventually gave me a number to ring if I ever wanted an hour or two with a girl considerably younger than my wife. I thanked him, gave the number a call that same night, and had a little chat with a Scottish bloke about visiting the brothel that weekend. It took a bit of convincing, and I had to drop my contact's name about five or six times before he actually believed that I wasn't a policeman or anything, but in the end, I secured myself an appointment at a time I believed our client's husband would also be there. I was very, very confident that he'd be there too, but that was something I found particularly confusing. Most visitors stayed for 15 minutes to an hour, then departed using the house's rear entrance that led into an alleyway around the back. Yet her client's husband usually stayed for up to three to four hours, and I wanted to figure out why. We'd been assured by the client that the more information we secured, 
the more money we'd get as a kind of bonus payment, as the seedier the details, the more easily she'd be able to get his signature on the divorce papers. I'm not sure if this was her intending to blackmail him into signing, as well as parting with a sizable amount of money, but I wasn't exactly in the position to complain about getting a fatter wage packet than I was already expecting. So on the weekend in question, I drive over to the brothel, give the woman on the door my fake name and the little password we'd arranged, and was led into a room where all the girls were all sat around. The idea was that I picked one I wanted to spend some time with before chatting her up a bit and talking prices. Some of the girls were definitely using drugs, you could just tell by their demeanors, and I was willing to bet that the brothel was keeping them dependent on crack, heroin, or a combination of the two, in order to keep them pliant and loyal. That was just a side note for the initial phase of my arrival though, as all I was doing was keeping an eye out for our client's husband. The idea was that, using the little micro camera I'd fitted into the chest pocket of my jacket, I'd pretend to recognize him from somewhere, approach him, get him on film, then apologize for mistaking him from someone else. My method was to pretend to be horribly indecisive about picking which girl I wanted, so I could spend the maximum amount of time in the one room I was bound to bump into him, which was little reception area that I'd been guided into by the person I assumed was the host. Yet after about 45 minutes of dilly-dallying with the girls, I knew I had to pick one before I started arousing suspicion. The bloke had to be in the building somewhere, as I had already spotted his car parked a few streets over from the brothel. It was just a case of placing myself in a position where I could bump into him and make it look accidental. Eventually, I resigned myself to going upstairs with one of the girls, spending a bit of time with her, then apologizing for my lack of performance and asking if I could visit again sometime when I was feeling a bit more up to it. So, off I go upstairs with one of the girls. But when we get to the second floor landing, who walks across the hallway with one of the girls in his grip but our client's husband? It was so fast that I didn't have the time to put the old mistaken identity part of my plan into action, but I did spot which room he was headed into. All I had to do was think of a reason to go into that room and bingo, I'd have my footage of him with one of the girls. So then, as I'm on the third floor with my girl of choice, I apologize and tell her that I need to use the toilet. She hazily gives me some directions for a small toilet that was also on the third floor, but I then used the opportunity to head down onto the second floor so I could accidentally walk into the room my target was so I could get him on film. I mentally prepared myself for seeing something I'd rather not, and if that sounds a bit too squeamish for an ex-police officer, just know I always found sleaze to be far more disgusting than any kind of violence or gore. So like I said, I crept towards the door that I knew my man was in, turned the doorknob, then opened up the door with a rather innocent-sounding is this the toilet? I knew I'd see something grim. I just didn't think it would be nearly as grim as what I actually saw. Our client's husband wasn't even doing the deed in there, but what he was doing had my jaw tickling the floor all the same. In a chair near the back window was the girl he pulled into the room, and I do mean pulled. She's sitting in it with her arm stretched out, while our target was in the process of shooting up a vein with what I can only assume was heroin. He wasn't just visiting the brothel, he bloody well worked at the brothel, and his job obviously involved doing something that I can only describe as pure evil. The girl was obviously too inexperienced a drug user to shoot up herself, so he was doing it for her, acting as an integral part of getting the girls hooked on drugs so they wouldn't just run off somewhere else. I was so shocked that I didn't even give him the, I'm so sorry, I thought this was the toilet line. I just stood there for a second genuinely stunned by what I was looking at. I appreciate that makes me sound a little bit of a wuss, but I've gotten the whole thing so wrong that the reality hit me like a ton of bricks. I didn't even think to lean into the room to get him on camera, so I'm lucky he actually got up and physically pushed me out of the room so I could at least get an image of his face. I didn't even bother going back up to the girl. I had already paid my money and I had my footage. The job was done and by then it was just a case of providing the footage to the client. Given that it was my investigation, I had to be there when she was told the news and when she watched the footage herself. When she learned what her husband was actually doing, I think it made her wish that he was just having an affair. She still wanted a divorce alright, but 
I think she wanted it a thousand times more than she had before. Knowing your husband as being unfaithful is one thing, but then knowing he's an evil creep who gets young girls addicted to drugs so they can be sold, that's another story entirely, isn't it? Working as a private investigator isn't nearly as exciting as you might think. I speak to some people who seem to assume that everything I do is right out of a noir detective story from the 1940s. They think I spend half my time in mortal danger, tracking down victims of human trafficking or trying to catch some gangsters sleeping around after his sultry cigarette-smoking wife traipses into my office in the dead of night. Yet, I take the odd job that ends up being a bit of a thrill, but 90% of the time it's kind of the thing that's just too boring or inconsequential to go to the actual police with. For example, I occasionally get jobs from companies who employees are playing at being too sick to work. They need me to prove that they're actually just telling fibs so they can give them the sack and cut off a massive drain on company resources. The only exciting thing about that is employing the classic stalking techniques and sniping pictures of them playing five astride or going to the gym all after they claim to be too depressed to go outside or they pulled their backs out or something. But I did take this one job, trying to catch a guy playing hooky from work that ended up almost being the end of me. Not only that, but my end would have been one of the most excruciatingly painful deaths imaginable, and there might not have been a trace of me left for the police to find. Long story short, I ended up trafficking the fellow's movements until I noticed something very unusual about his routine. Two nights a week, always random nights, he'd leave his house and drive down to a warehouse on the dock road, one that I was almost certain was a derelict. He'd stay for a few hours, then sometimes emerge with what appeared to be a lot of cash stuffed into a brown envelope. I couldn't know this for certain, but I had my suspicions and all I had to do was prove he was possibly moonlighting at another job so I could provide the evidence to his employer. So one night, I follow him into the warehouse climbing over walls and scrambling under fences, all at an age where I was far too old to be doing anything like that, so I can catch him in the act of doing whatever it was he was doing. I'd reckon that I'd just use the old excuse of, sorry, I'm a bit lost, could you point me in the right direction to get out of here, and obviously if the business was a legitimate one, I'd just be escorted off the property. Even if I snapped a few pictures of the guy at work or what have you, they couldn't confiscate my camera, and I couldn't be charged with trespassing if I simply claimed ignorance and agreed to leave when told to. Except the business wasn't legitimate, and the blokes running it definitely didn't want anyone to know what they were doing. As I approached the warehouse building, I could hear the occasional bark and yelp of what sounded a lot like dogs, as well as some whooping and cheering from the blokes inside. I walked in, snapped a few pictures of the interior, and immediately recognized that I'd made a huge mistake. Inside was what looked a lot like a makeshift arena, constructed of chest-high metal barriers that the blokes were crowded around, and although I couldn't see them, the sounds of the dogs coming from inside the little arena thing told me all I needed to know about what I'd stumbled into. It was a midnight dogfight. The blokes had seen me snapping pictures and by then, getting out of there with a few nimbly worded excuses was the least of my problems. They chased me, grabbed me, and dragged me back into the warehouse. I was beaten, had my camera taken off me, then picked up and taken to the edge of the little fighting pit they'd constructed. It was an absolute horror show. In the middle of the blood-soaked arena was a dead pit bull of some kind. It might have been some other breed, but I don't really know dog breeds, so forgive me if it was actually something else. And standing over it was the obvious victor of the fight that had just occurred. And to my horror, I realized that they wanted to literally feed me the victor. The fighting pit was thankfully cut into the floor of the warehouse, which I suppose it had to be to prevent the dogs from jumping out. So as they hoisted me up and threatened to throw me in with the dog, it was only a few feet from being able to literally bite my face off. Along with taking my camera off me, they emptied my pockets and had obviously had a good look at my driver's license to find out who I was. Having my wallet also meant that they'd gotten a hold of my PI business cards too. So not only did they know who I was, but they knew why I was there too. At first, 
I was threatened with being thrown in with the dogs, and I'm ashamed to say it, but I think I soiled myself a bit when I begged them not to. I think that actually might have saved my life, because upon smelling what I just deposited in my trousers, they dropped me onto the concrete with grimaces and a chorus of disgusted noises. After that, I got a few more kicks and punches, to my head and shoulders only, I might add, before the bloke that I assumed was in charge came over with my driver's license in his hand. He told me he was keeping it, because if any police were sniffing around the area in the weeks to come, they'd know whose house they needed to visit to make things right. I was told, in no uncertain terms, that I'd be killed if I told anyone what I'd seen or who I'd seen doing it. But after that, the most shocking event of the evening occurred. The ringleaders started playing good cop, if I can put it that way, and started apologizing for the way they treated me when they'd first spotted me snapping pictures. I was told that they thought that I was a police officer, in which case I'd probably never have left the warehouse alive, but since he knew I was a PI, he knew that the only real motivator was cash, and he seemed to have plenty on hand. He asked me who I was working for, as well as how much they were paying me, and since I'm not exactly some hard case, I just fessed up with it and told him. He then counts out a few hundred quid in fifties, puts them in my pocket, and tells me that I'm to cease working for the clients as, in his words, you work for me now. However, he did reinforce that since I'd been paid, I'd be doubly buggered if they caught wind of any police hanging around the site, and that he'd, and I'm quoting him directly here, iron my chest if he thought I'd told anyone what I'd saw. In all my years as a P.I., I'd never heard anyone threaten to do something as horrible as that. I mean, can you even imagine the evil creativity of someone who'd think to use a frigging clothes iron as a method of torture? I had already had one of the worst nights of my life. I didn't want anything to top it anytime soon, so again, as much as I'm ashamed to say it, I did as I was told. I cancelled the job with the client, which also meant that I didn't get a penny for my hours, but I honestly wasn't too fussed since I'd gotten to walk away with my life, as well as a bit of dirty money to cover the hours. I know that makes me just as bad as them in a way, knowing about something as horrible as a dog fighting ring and not doing a thing to stop it. But what could I do? They'd have known it was me, and I'd have to flee the city of my birth with only about thirty grand in savings. And yes, I was also terrified that by some coincidence, the police would end up investigating them anyway, in which case I'd have a hard time proving that I'd kept my mouth shut. I lost a lot of sleep over that one, I can assure you, but no one ever turned up at my door in the middle of the night, so I'm assuming they're still going into that makeshift fighting pit down on the dock road. Note how I've chosen to leave out a lot of details here, and I've actually gone as far as obscuring the actual place I found the fighting pit, just in case any overzealous blog readers decide to phone this in with a lack of regard for my safety. And that's my story of the most terrifying incident of my PI career, and it's one I'm in no mind to have repeated anytime soon. I keep myself at arm's length from cases now, at all times, and I don't do anything that might put me in a similar position of danger. I'd say this to anyone wanting to get into PI work too. Money is money, but no amount is worth losing your life for. In my career as a private detective, I work some very, very unusual cases, but the one I'm about to share with you today is by far the weirdest and creepiest of them all. From the moment I had the person walk into my office, to the moment I presented them with the file containing everything I'd learned, the whole thing was just a trip into madness that got darker and darker until I couldn't believe what I'd been charged with finding, even when it was staring me in the face. The PI firm I worked for hired me as their IT guy. Most of the investigations specialized in field work, which is like your standard following of unfaithful wives or husbands, finding missing people, and that kind of thing. The only thing they were lacking when they hired me, though, was someone who knew how to use the internet. I'm not just talking Google searches and social media lookups. I'm talking about breaking into private networks, using Tor browsers, all kinds of hacker-related and dark web stuff that the average internet user just isn't familiar with. Anyway... This one morning, I get a text from my boss asking me to come into the office. I hardly ever went into the office as I could do most of my work from home, but 
My boss said that I had to talk to a client in person and in private, which was part of her conditions for hiring us. So I got into the office, where I'm guided into one of our meeting rooms where this girl is sat with my boss. She's really pretty, strikingly so, so naturally I'm only too happy to sit and talk with her for a while as she goes over the job with me. It seemed like a pretty standard piece of internet sleuthing at first. I had to scour the internet for anything I could find on a person, then present everything I dug up to the client. Only, the person the client wanted me to look up was her. In all my years working for the company, I'd never ever gotten a job like that before. I'd taken plenty of them that involved looking other people up, missing people, exes who'd ghosted on their partners, stuff like that. But no one had ever asked me to look up their own self before showing them everything that I'd found. Like I said, this girl was really, really pretty, so trawling through her various social media accounts, as well as little mentions of her in high school newspapers or whatever, it was barely work. I know that might sound creepy, but it is what it is. After a few days, all I can find is some fairly innocuous stuff. Nothing remotely seedy, nothing that might jeopardize her reputation as an elementary school teacher, which I'm pretty sure was the goal of the whole exercise. But still, something didn't sit right with me. I know that most people who take up a career in education have to purge their social media accounts of them ripping bong hits or partying on the Jersey Shore in a micro bikini or whatever, but this was the first that I'd heard of someone paying a lot of money to a PI firm to dig through their own personal history. I suppose that's why I'm paid what I'm paid though, because I don't just scratch the surface with my work. I dig deep, really deep, and I always find what I'm looking for. And since I hadn't found anything that might warrant a really deep dive, I decided to go the extra mile to find something worth presenting to the client. One of the tools I use in my searches is kind of like a highly advanced Google Lens. It's a computer program that can feed photographs into it and scours the dark web for similar or identical looking photos. It can also find faces, items of clothing, backdrops of rooms a picture might be taken in. It's honestly very impressive. I procured it from the same guy who created the program that finds deleted tweets and Facebook statuses, and if you didn't know that was a thing, let me assure you, it is. The concept of nothing on the internet ever really being deleted might be something of a cliché, but the average user has no idea how true it is. Think of it like the Wayback Machine, the tool which means you can essentially time travel through digital space to see how web pages looked in the past, then tie that to the whole concept of the military or government possessing way more advanced tech than is available to the public at any particular period. There are data traps and executables out there available for purchase for the right price and from the right people that put your run-of-the-mill duck-duck Google searches to shame. And it was through using one of these programs that I came across a Tor webpage that belonged to our client. Now it's pretty easy to code a website that is basically becomes an unlockable subscription service. You can even code it to only accept cryptocurrency in a way that obscures the personal data of its subscribers. This is the kind of website that belonged to our client. And since I've probably bored you enough with the technicalities of this case, I'll get to the juicy stuff. Or rather, the stuff that was so creepy made my skin crawl. One thing you need to know about this girl is that, despite being very pretty, she looked young. I know she was in her mid-twenties, but given how short she was, not to mention, and I phrase this delicately, how underdeveloped she looked, I'm not sure she could get into PG-13 movies without someone getting mildly suspicious. I'm not one to pry into medical histories and whatnot, but I'm pretty sure she had some kind of condition, and it meant that although she was most certainly a grown woman, she looked no older than a girl in her early teens. If you haven't guessed where this is going already, allow me to elaborate while putting things as much in layman's terms as I can. Our client has basically set up an OnlyFans, and was lying about her age, doctored ID and all, so that she could extract payments from those who are physically attracted to those that aren't of age. To put it bluntly, she was scamming creepy older men by pretending she was underage. She wasn't just posing nude either. She had managed to construct an entire persona of a girl no older than 13, one who was living in a very broken home, and one who was ripe for exploitation. I don't even want to recall some of the comments I read on her pictures and videos, and some of the photo shoot setups were nothing short of nauseating. 
After browsing for little over five minutes, I realized that this was the thing she wanted us to find. Only, she didn't just want us to find it. She wanted us to know how we'd found it. And that wasn't something I was comfortable sharing either with her or with you. I'd like to keep my tricks firmly up my sleeve, otherwise I might well be out of a job. I'm very good at what I do, and I'm well aware that it's not so much what's in my head as the tools I use, and since my boss pays me very handsomely to do what I do, I'd have to be a moron to share the names of files, programs, or the sources I use to find them. She wasn't happy with that, as she obviously wanted to keep her page away from the prying eyes of those who didn't wish to patronize it. But since the terms of her contract with us were clearly laid out, and we only had to present with the what and not with the how, she walked away a few grand short nevertheless. However, before she left, I wanted to make it clear just how much she was playing with fire. Although I was unable to dig into the lives and personas of those who subscribed to her site, which was actually something of a consolation to her, I wanted to warn her that they were undoubtedly some very, very dangerous people. She didn't care for my warnings, however. She was just angry that she'd end up in court if she refused to pay for the information we provided her with. In the end, I got paid, and she walked away unhappy, and I moved on to my usual affair of looking up exes, finding secret bank accounts, and everything else my boss pays me to do. But I'd never forgotten that girl, or what she did for money, and I sometimes wonder if it's caught up with her yet or if she's going to continue enabling some of the most hideously criminal people in our already messed up society. Following my discharge from marine intelligence, cue the oxymoron jokes, I ended up getting a job working for one of the top private investigation firms in San Diego, and because of my background in electronics, my usual fare was anything involving bugs, as in hidden surveillance devices, not the creepy crawly kind. Anyway, one day, we get a call from a client who believed that his office was bugged, the office being in a trailer that sat in the backyard of his home. My boss suggested that he might just be a little paranoid, but when I found out that he was a subcontractor for a big oil field construction company, I advised my boss to take the job. I have a cousin who works in that field and I know exactly how competitive it can be, so it didn't seem like the craziest thing in the world that they might be installing listening devices which would help them steal contracts from each other. So we drove out to visit the guy, I performed a full electronic sweep, but we found absolutely nothing. There were no devices implanted in his phones, nothing giving off any burst transmissions, nothing to give any reason to believe that he was being monitored in any way. But still, he insisted on a full physical sweep of the trailer, inside and out, telling us how he wasn't crazy and that he was sure that it was being spied on somehow. We actually ended up crawling under the trailer, checking out the whole roof of the trailer and still found nothing of note. When we just about exhausted our patience, we thanked him for the opportunity but tell him that we'll be on our way. Then he says something along the lines of, I know I might sound crazy, but just pick up my phone. Press 9 to get an outside line and you'll start hearing all sorts of clicking sounds. Lo and behold, we do as he asks, and there's a clicking sound on the line. We then check the phones in his actual house and the same clicking sounds can be heard. They were definitely very faint, but I could definitely hear them. This was without any kind of bug being detectable anywhere on his property or on the phone lines outside and in all my years of working for marine intelligence, I'd never heard of any kind of technology that could listen in on someone's phone without being detectable using the right investigative techniques. He wasn't happy to hear it, but in the end, I actually advised the guy to move. What I wanted to say to him basically was, whatever you're up to, you angered the wrong people. Because my clearance wasn't exactly up to CIA level, but I knew someone with some seriously advanced tech was using it to tap into the guy's phone. I don't know what the guy was up to or who was listening in on him, but it had to be seriously high up in government for them to be able to run a tap without being detectable by someone like me. I then advised my boss, in private, to just take the two grand we'd agreed on and put as much distance between us and the guy as physically possible, because whatever he'd gotten himself into, it was way, way beyond our pay grade. 
About two weeks later, I see a report on TV that the guy had gone missing. His family had thrown a bunch of money at a newspaper to get the guy's picture and on their pages too, as my boss showed me when we went into work the following day. I still have no clue what that guy had going on in his life, or who might have been watching or listening to him, but whoever they were, they had the means to make a very wealthy, very important man just up and disappear without a trace. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.